Hi, this is Nurse Inga. Today we're talking about pediatric respiratory disorders and management. There are distinct anatomical differences between the infant and the adult airway. Infants are obligate nose breathers. They only breathe through their mouth if it's already open, like when they're crying. They have to use their abdominal muscles and their intercostal muscles to breathe because their diaphragm is underdeveloped. And they normally have a faster respiratory rate and an irregular respiratory pattern because their neuromuscular system is immature. Until about age two, they have a large floppier epiglottis and a malleable soft trachea. The epiglottis is U-shaped as you can see here in this picture. This is the infant. And the um, trachea itself is right in here. So you can see how small that opening is versus in the adult, this is the epiglottis and these are the vocal cords and this is the trachea. So you can see the difference in size and shape. In infants, the glottis or that glottic area where the vocal cords are is anterior and superior. So it's kind of further towards the front and higher up closer to the base of the tongue, which makes it very easy to be obstructed by the tongue or foreign body. And in the infant airway, the cricoid ring below the level of the cords is the smallest diameter, meaning that an object could get through the cords and stuck in the trachea, completely obstructing airflow. Versus in the adult, the cords are the smallest diameter. So if an object can get through the cords, it can actually make it into the right or left main stem bronchi and you can still ventilate through the other side. Um, or it doesn't make it through the cords and it just gets stuck above it. It's critical that you can recognize the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress and intervene prior to respiratory failure which can quickly decompensate to respiratory arrest and death. Respiratory distress is increased work of breathing, and the child will present with tachypnea, nasal flaring. They will stick out their chin as if they're trying to smell something called the sniffing position. You'll notice accessory muscle use, retractions underneath the clavicles and top and the bottom of the sternum and in between and underneath all of the ribs. Grunting on exhalation is um, more common with things like pneumonia or heart failure. And then anxiety, restlessness, and agitation are all signs that this child is really struggling to maintain adequate gas exchange. Respiratory failure occurs then when the child becomes fatigued and the respiratory rate then starts to drop. They become hypoxic, cyanotic, which is a very late finding in children, bradycardic, from a lack of oxygen to the myocardium. The head starts to bob, so it comes up when they're breathing in and goes down when they're breathing out. And that's a sign of kind of like impending respiratory arrest. And then severe altered mental status, like unresponsiveness. Respiratory arrest then is kind of imminent when you see that happening if you haven't already intervened, um, quickly followed by cardiac arrest and death. So it's important to recognize those early signs of respiratory distress and take good steps to manage the airway. So your approach to airway management should be very organized. First pad underneath the shoulders in an infant to maintain the head in neutral position. If you hear um, gurgling, then you want to suction out the oral pharynx, or if there's a lot of secretions in the nose, you want to suction the nasal pharynx. If the patient's unresponsive and has no gag reflex, then you can use an oral pharyngeal airway to help maintain an open airway because it keeps the tongue off the back of the throat. Provide oxygen therapy to any child in respiratory distress. And positive pressure ventilations like a bag valve mask or a CPAP if the respirations are too slow, too shallow, or ineffective. But for a child who's not breathing, only a bag valve mask would be an option or mouth to mouth, um, but we don't use a CPAP on somebody who is not awake or um, breathing on their own. 
Perform foreign body airway obstruction maneuvers if the child is choking. And if they are choking and they become unresponsive, just do CPR. So let's review some common respiratory complaints related to infection and inflammation of the airways. One way that we protect children from acute respiratory illness is through immunizations. Immunizations expose the immune system to the antigens or the proteins on the outside of the cells, creating memory cells and antibodies. This is known as active artificial immunity because the body creates the immunity without having contracted the disease. Or the child could actually have a disease like catching a cold and then they would have active natural immunity because the body would remember the proteins on the outside of the pathogen that was in the body and create antibodies to that. In the upper airway, uh, we see a lot of URIs or upper respiratory tract infections. So these are very common. Viral URIs are probably the most common and these are just treated with rest, hydration, pain and fever management, and then nasal rinses or suction to keep the um, nasal passages open. Sinusitis is also common and it's often allergic or viral in nature, but you need to monitor that carefully for the development of um, a bacterial infection like you know high fever, purulent drainage, um, seem to be getting better and now suddenly getting worse kind of things. Antihistamines can help some children with sinusitis, but antihistamines and decongestants are kind of age dependent, so it's going to depend on the pediatrician or the physician that's seeing them. Influenza remains a problem for children because the fever can quickly cause dehydration. And then secondary infections like pneumonia can actually be fatal. So people don't really die of the flu, they die of side effects of the flu. Seasonal flu shots are recommended, um, including pregnant women and then uh, children of uh, all ages once they're old enough to have it, which is typically six months. Pharyngitis is a sore throat, and that should be evaluated for bacterial infection. Strep pharyngitis is often treated with antibiotics to avoid potential complications like rheumatic fever or glomerulonephritis. And tonsillitis is a common finding in children as well. So monitor the airway and the ability to swallow carefully. Treat infection um, if it's bacterial, and then also treat the pain and the fever. In the area of the vocal cords or the glottis, we typically see two things, Crip syndromes in children under the age of like five or six, because the airways are so small in diameter that you get that strider and that creepy cough. And then epiglottitis in older children and even adults now because their Haemophilus influenza B vaccine is wearing off. So croup syndromes are characterized by this hallmark strider and seal barking cough with subglottic edema. So the swelling is actually just below the level of the vocal cords. Um, cool mist and steroids are often used to decrease this viral inflammation. And nebulized racemic epinephrine is also um, a possible therapy because it works really well to vasoconstrict and decrease the edema so it opens up the airway. But usually it's just very supportive therapy, rest, hydration, fever management if they have a fever, it's oftentimes worse at night and better during the day. Laryngotracheal bronchitis, which is also called like classic croup, usually is preceded by two to three days of a viral URI. And kind of the peak age range is like, you know, in the kind of three year olds is where we tend to see a lot of this. The picture that I have here for you is epiglottitis. So epiglottitis is a bacterial infection of the epiglottis, and it swells in size to the point where it can completely obstruct the airway. This truly is a life-threatening emergency. You want to keep the child upright, even leaning forward. Um, you'll notice that they probably are drooling. They can't swallow their secretions because the epiglottis is so large in their throat. Um, oftentimes, they'll either tripod or lean forward themselves. They may have strider with inspiration. Um, oxygen therapy is fine, but don't put anything in the mouth and don't make them cry because that can also trigger laryngospasm, just like anything that you stick in their mouth. Call for help or notify the physician um, to let them know because you know these are children where all the airway stuff should be set up. We should be prepared for intubation. And as you see here, the child on the right who has the epiglottitis is intubated.
Moving down into the lower airways, um, you know, bronchitis in kids is not really any different than bronchitis in adults, but bronchiolitis is. So adults don't tend to get bronchiolitis because our airways are, are larger. Um, we do get RSV, but we just get it as the common cold. We don't really recognize that we have RSV. Children, however, when they get RSV, it inflames their smaller airways, which are so narrow that it causes a significant uh, respiratory problem for them. So RSV is um, statistically one of the most common causes of bronchiolitis in kids. And in small children or children with previous respiratory problems, it actually can become life-threatening. You want to use droplet and contact precautions with RSV because it is uh, very contagious. And oftentimes we'll put them in a mist tent, which is also referred to as a croupette, which you can see here. Um, and we give them... Um, ribavirin and ribavirin is an antiviral medication that is a known teratogen so no pregnant people can be in the room and also because it's nebulized and it's kind of floating around it adheres to contact lenses so people can't be wearing contact lenses while they're in the room so it's not just pregnant providers it's no pregnant family members or visitors either can be in the room uh, while they're receiving the ribavirin Pneumonia in kids is very similar to adults. They oftentimes get um, lethargic, a decreased appetite, increased respiratory rate, decreased O2 sat, uh, fever. Sometimes they'll complain of back or abdominal pain, uh, wheezes. Um, you might hear some ronchi or adventitious lung sounds. We treat it the same way. So antibiotic therapy, if you know it seems like it's bacterial, bronchodilators, nebulizers to open up the airways and help them um, cough out or expectorate some of that mucus, and then oxygen therapy if they are in respiratory distress or hypoxic. Hydration is important. Fever management is important. Pain management is important. All of that remains the same. Let's finish off by reviewing some chronic respiratory diseases of childhood. So cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive um, disease. And it's uh, so that both parents have to have the recessive gene. And it's diagnosed by a chloride sweat test because the child has um, a problem with uh, chloride transport, basically. Um, it's characterized by this very thick respiratory GI and reproductive tract mucus that plugs things up, um, and as well as very salty uh, sweat and secretion. So there's a loss of excessive electrolytes like sodium and chloride in the sweat. They have very salty tasting skin. Um, they get a lot of mucus plugging and lung infections um, in the respiratory tract. They get a lot of um, kind of a meconium ileus and uh, obstruction of the pancreas in the GI tract and, um, you know, poor growth and weight loss because they have difficulty breaking down and absorbing nutrients. Um, there's also a significant percentage that um, are infertile. So uh, a lot of what we focus on is the respiratory piece of this, chest physiotherapy, we provide nebulizers prior to chest physiotherapy to really open up and dilate those airways so that while they're doing the percussion and the vibration and the postural drainage, that the airways are open and that mucus can clear more easily. Um, and then in terms of diet, we want to replace the lost pancreatic enzymes and then also provide diets that are high in protein and calories and fat soluble vitamins and they can eat salt freely so there's no restrictions on what they can have for salt it's important to remember that even though life expectancy is increasing this remains a terminal illness and so it's important to help the family um, with coping and the child with facing death because um, just because overall life expectancy is increasing some children still will have very short life expectancies if they have severe form of cystic fiber. Asthma is characterized by this inflammation and edema of the mucous membranes with excess mucus production and then constriction of the bronchial smooth muscles you can see here on the right. Um, 
This leads to expiratory wheezing, cough, shortness of breath, activity intolerance. Treatment really is centered on um, quite a few things, but primary care and prevention. So we want to identify and avoid triggers and then provide the appropriate medication therapy for that individual. Follow-up is really important. They need to keep all of their appointments, and then immunizations are essential, especially things like pneumonia vaccines and flu shots. As with all children with chronic disease, we always focus on what they can do more than what they can't do. So you really wanna encourage participation in activities that are safe and age appropriate. Swimming is often very well tolerated because of the nice, you know, humid, moist atmosphere. Um, baseball, activities that have like shorter sprints or running and gymnastics are also often well tolerated. Uh, but things that have like this prolonged intense activity like you know uh, long distance running um, racing or uh, even basketball because there's just this continuous running up and down the court um, things like soccer field hockey are probably not as well tolerated uh, for a patient who has like you know worse asthma um, because you know they need uh, rest in between so you can pre-medicate with bronchodilators like albuterol or chromalin sulfate just prior to activity um, and use the asthma action plans that are created by the physician when they're at school to gauge the child's level of difficulty and decide on what the next course of uh, treatment should be. So should they take more medication, should they rest, or should they uh, go home or go to the emergency room. It's important to recognize that we have come so far in the management of asthma in the out of hospital setting that children now who do present to the hospital with asthma oftentimes are so critically ill because they have done all of the things that they normally would do they've done their inhalers they've done their nebulizers all their rescue medications plus all of their you know just control medications on a daily basis um, that when they do end up now in the emergency room, that oftentimes that is a potentially life-threatening experience for them. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is the last chronic thing that I want to talk about. And this is um, usually affects premature infants when they are born without enough surfactant and the lungs aren't well developed. So despite trying to prevent premature birth and despite giving mom steroids or even giving the baby surfactant at birth, um, if the baby has to go on oxygen and ventilation with positive pressure ventilations for any significant point in time after delivery, the lungs themselves can develop um, kind of like scarring and thickening of the tissue um, related to uh, oxygen damage and um, excessive ventilation pressures. And this was more common with higher concentration oxygen and endotracheal intubation. And we have done a remarkable job decreasing the incidence of BPD with the use of CPAP, like you see here with this cute little one in this picture. So this is a nasal prong CPAP that is on this baby. And then that's a feeding tube that you see in the mouth. Um, so our primary goal really is still focusing on prevention and trying to decrease preterm labor, um, you know, keeping a mom for long enough to get um, kind of her steroids and then um, avoiding uh, intubation, high flow oxygen and um, prolonged positive pressure ventilation. But if the child does develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD, once it's diagnosed, it's important to recognize and manage the symptoms. So the things that we see are like wheezing, retractions, cyanosis with exertion, accessory muscle use, chronic hypoxia so that leads to clubbing of the fingernails and even the toenails, um, failure to thrive, meaning that they don't reach the natural uh, milestones on the growth chart, and then irritability uh, from hypoxia. And these are children who will have lifelong respiratory issues um, and, and you know they, they appear to be like chronic little COPD kids at you know the age of newborn. Um, so uh, depending on how bad the disease is um, you know some get put on a list for like lung transplants and others manage with uh, medication and um, kind of like occupational 
therapy, um, adjusting their lifestyle. So to summarize, respiratory problems can be chronic, infectious, or inflammatory. And medications used on the respiratory system include things like bronchodilators, which would include like your albuterol, which is a beta-2 agonist, uh, chromalin sulfate, which is a mast cell stabilizer. You have your methyl xanthines like theophylline. All of those drugs cause tachycardia. So anytime you have a bronchodilator, the side effect of that is going to be tachycardia. Um, and then fine tremors. Those are things that are normal. If you see them, it's fine. You reassure the patient that's normal. It happens. Um, so it's important that you really know the side effects of these drugs that you're giving. Like steroids, we know that steroids are powerful anti-inflammatories. They really help to decrease that swelling and edema in the respiratory tract, but it also increases blood glucose and it increases the risk of secondary infections like thrush or you know a skin breakdown or you know, yeast infection, you know, a vaginal yeast infection, things like that. So it's important to really keep in mind that um, not only should your assessment include looking for these things, your teaching should include these things with the patient or the parent, depending on the age, um, and you should be monitoring for these things as uh, possible side effects of these drugs. And then antibiotics, again, put us at risk for secondary infections like yeast infections, um, or opportunistic infections like C. diff, and then um, allergic reactions. Obviously, oxygen is also a drug that's used on the respiratory tract. So just be alert to the common side effects of these uh, medications. When you're caring for a pediatric patient who's had surgery of the respiratory tract, remember that they have a higher risk of airway complications because they have much smaller airways. Even a little bit of trauma can lead to swelling and loss of airway. Um, they're more difficult to manage. They're more difficult to intubate. So um, greater risk of complications. The teeth can be loose and they can fall out. And this obviously could be a problem. They could aspirate a tooth. Um, they could swallow a tooth. But we like to know where teeth go and we don't want them to go into the airway. So if you notice any loose teeth, um, make sure that you keep an eye on those and report them to the anesthesiologist preoperatively um, and you know, uh, look in the mouth postoperatively to make sure all the teeth are still there. Surgeries of the airway, like uh, tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, um, any sort of palate or sinus surgery, any sort of soft tissue surgery, um, all this is very highly vascular tissue so all of this mucous membranes in your respiratory tract is very highly vascular so there's a high risk for bleeding postoperatively um, and that means that there's a risk for aspiration or airway obstruction if the bleeding is into the soft tissues it could swell or if the bleeding is you know um, very overt uh, then they're going to swallow it and they could vomit and aspirate as well so if you don't see obvious bleeding they could still be swallowing it so just monitor for frequent swallowing that's a really common thing that you'll see um, in somebody who has had uh, tonsillectomy is if they are having post-operative bleeding you'll see frequent swallowing um, so overall just really remember it's important to use an organized approach to your assessment no normal values by age, and these aren't things that you should necessarily memorize, but have you know some sort of a card or some sort of a reference that you can use. What I you know affectionately refer to as my peripheral brain. Recognize the signs of respiratory distress and intervene prior to failure. Recognize the hallmark signs of epiglottitis so that you don't accidentally make it worse, and then take appropriate precautions for infectious disorders and provide support for patients and families who have chronic disease. Thank you so much for watching.